Well, thank you all for coming, uh, both our uh, online audience and uh, people in the room. It is uh, noon on the east coast of the United States of America. That means it's sea star time, like almost every two weeks. Before I introduce uh, today's speakers, uh, mul multiple, um, I want to alert you to the talk in two weeks time and we will um, be virtually visited by Michael Ullman and he'll be talking about the neurocognition of developmental language disorder and I'm sure he'll talk about ties to a work on stroke and language impairment as well in adults. Uh, so that should be interesting. Uh, for today, uh, we have a threesome presentation which is uh, really cool. We got to talking uh, about a year ago uh, about uh, ways to model and to interpret outcome data from uh, interventional studies in aphasia and uh, Drs. Will Hula, uh, Kirasimus Fekadiotis and Grant Walker uh, uh, offered to, uh, to give a C-star talk uh, on this topic. So that's why we're here today. So, um, uh, Will Hula is a speech pathologist at the VA Pittsburgh Healthcare System, uh, Audiology and Speech Pathology Program. He's also adjunct faculty in the Department of Communication Sciences and Disorders at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, his research uh, uh, interests include the measurement of language performance and patient reported functioning in aphasia, uh, the application of latent trait measurement models to aphasia assessment, aphasia treatment, and brain behavior relationships in language and aphasia. Uh, he will be giving the talk today, but uh, he is also joined uh, in mind, uh, certainly an effort uh, by uh, Dr. Gerasimus Vergadiotis, who is a professor in the Department of Speech and Hearing Sciences at, at Portland State University. His research focuses on developing uh, psychometric applications for quantifying cognitive linguistic deficits in people with communication disorders. And specifically, uh, an overarching goal of his research is to develop uh, computer adaptive tests to assist professionals with uh, diagnosis of word retrieval deficits. And then, uh, last but not least, is our very own Grant Walker. I say our very own because he is part of the Center for the Study of um, Aphasia Recovery, CSTAR, uh, which is another reason why we're here. Grant Walker is a postdoctoral researcher uh, in the Auditory and Language Neuroscience Lab at the University of California, Irvine, where he works with Dr. Greg Hickok. Uh, his research is focused on understanding the mechanisms that support speech and language functions how these mechanisms are impaired by brain injury, and how best to repair them. Um, and with that, because I don't want to take up all the speakers' time, we only have so much, I'm going to give the floor to Dr. Will Hula. Enjoy. Thanks, sir. Um, so yeah, uh, I, we all appreciate the invitation to come present today. And so what I'm going to try and do in the course of the next uh, 45 minutes or so is talk to you about a program of research that Gerasimus and I have been engaged in um, for the better part of a decade now. And then if I can time things correctly, hopefully at least some time at the end also to talk about some of the really outstanding work that Grant has done over the past few years in collaboration with folks here at CSTAR and link it up to, to our program of research. Um, so that's the, 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 uh, the broad agenda as it were. Um, so I'll just start with you know, the observation that um, confrontation naming is you know, universally assessed in the care of folks with aphasia, both in the clinic and in clinical research. And there are a bunch of tools that can be used for that purpose, um, a few of which are shown here on this slide. Um, they, um, unfortunately, they don't do a great job of, of talking to one another, and then there's some other limitations. And so to, to highlight those limitations, let's just consider for a minute the measurement of length. It's kind of the canonical example of what it means to measure something, right? So um, a meter you know, has a very specific de te technical definition, right? So it's, it's defined by the, the length of, of a path traveled by light over a certain period of time that's defined in terms of the speed of light and the, the atomic properties of the seizing atom, right? So like it's, it's, it's intentional model-based, and it's based on uh, units, constant units that are universal. And that has all kinds of benefits for society, because it means that if someone wants to measure length, you know, to develop a new tool for measuring length, they don't have to go out, you know, there, there's a very simple model for translating, you know, meters to feet, and so on and so forth, which just works. 
um, temperature works similarly. I had a slide about that that, that we're not going to take time with. Um, but the point is that measurement is a, an intentional process that uh, is model-based and ideally uh, works with units that don't change size as you move from one context to another or even up and down the same scale that you're working on. And I'm going to make the argument that, among other things, our current tools for measuring naming, also most of the other things we measure uh, in, in speech language pathology with, with folks with aphasia, don't, don't meet these tests, right? So there are four issues with uh, you know, confrontation naming assessments, which we'll take as a, as a case example, that, that, that are an issue here. One is that we can't really compare scores directly across instruments. If you have a score on the BNT, it, you know, there's no obvious crosswalk to the Philadelphia naming test or to the naming subtest of the WAB, for example. The second issue is that uh, most of the scoring models falsely assume that the units are equal intervals as you go up and down the scale. And I'm going to make the argument that that's not the case. Um, uh, the third issue is that most scoring models assume that the measurement error, which is important, right? Because you know, we're dealing with, with people who are noisy in their terms of their naming behavior. And so when we make it, you know, length is, is a nice case, right? It's deterministic, right? The measurement error is usually small enough that you can ignore it unless you're a physicist or something, right? But we don't have that luxury. So we need estimates of error to come with our measurements of, of anomia severity or naming behavior. And I'm going to make the argument that most of the scoring models in common use today don't properly account for measurement error. Um, and then the third piece is just a, an efficiency sort of practicality piece that if you're going to sit down and give a test, you've got to get the whole thing in order to get uh, a valid score estimate, right? It's a little bit like, you know, if you were going to measure something that was, um, you know, 10 feet long, you had to go and count everything in between. You couldn't just look and say, oh yeah, we're at 10 feet. <coughs> um, so I'm going to take hopefully not too much time and dig into each of these briefly and just kind of make the cases. So um, we can't compare scores directly across instruments. So let's imagine that we have two tests, an easy test and a hard test. So test A is an easy test composed of the, oh, there we go, is an easy test composed of the, the four easiest items from the Philadelphia naming test. And then we have test B composed of um, you know, a mix of the hard items from the Philadelphia and the Boston naming test. And let's imagine that we have two individuals, John and Jack. John gets 50% on the first test and Jack gets 47% on the second. What can we say about their relative naming impairment? Well, we know something about those items and their properties. We say, well, John is probably more impaired than Jack, but even though he got the higher percent correct score, right? So I think the point's made. We can't, the, the comparisons are not straightforward or intuitive. You have to have a lot of background knowledge in order to make them. Um, Um, the second point I want to make is that most scoring models falsely assume interval status. And so this comes from the fact that when you measure number correct on a naming assessment, it's bounded on two ends. If you're using the BNT, it's bounded at 0 and 60. If you're PNT, it's a little bit wider, 0 and 175. But that range is different because the items are different difficulty. Um, and you know it doesn't matter if you convert it to um, percent correct. It's even more obvious, right? You're bounded at 0 and 1. And what that has, that has the effect that it, it, it shrinks or it changes the meaning of the size of the units as you go up and down the scale. So if we take the two examples, the two example individuals from the second slide and say, well, one of them changed from 70% correct to 100% correct. The other changed from 20 to 50. I would have the intuition that I su suspect that many of you would share that, um, that Jack, who went from 70 to 100, probably that that's a more that's different, right? That's harder to achieve clinically, right? Than to move somebody from 20 to 50. And there's reasons for that, but the basic point here is that the units are not the same size as you go up and down the scale, which makes taking the average of change scores across people a little bit problematic, right? Because the the act of averaging numbers kind of assumes that they all mean the same thing. You're treating them as exchangeable. Um, is that, Dirk, is there a way to make that go away? Is it? No. Hide floating medium. Hide floating, there it is. Thank you. Um, so, right, the next point I want to address is 
the fact that most scoring models don't do a good job of dealing with measurement error. They assume that, you know, you get a standard error measurement for a test and then we apply it across the full range. I want to make the argument here that that's not actually how things are. Um, so if we take th this example of, you know, a very short, easy naming test composed of cat, key, eye, and bed. Um, and then let's imagine three hypothetical individuals, one who gets 0% correct on that test, one who gets 50% correct on that test, and one who gets 100% correct on that test. And, I th and it's both mathematically the case, and I think kind of intuitively obvious that we know the most, we have the most information in the statistical sense and in the colloquial sense about the person who got 50% correct, right? And, and the least about the person who got 100% correct, right? If a person with aphasia answers all four of those items correctly, you don't really know, I mean, you know something about their naming, but not much. Whereas if they get two of them wrong, you, you have you, you have more information, right? And so that's that's the point. And, and um, the uh, claim here is that this leads to um, incorrect inferences, right? Because when people make change uh, at the edges, that is either at the very low end or the very high end, if you're applying a constant um, standard error of measurement, you're going to Ross must help me. You're going to overestimate. I, I always get, get them backwards. You're, you're going to overestimate the extent to which there's change because you actually have more error there than you think you do. Whereas in the middle of the scale, where most people are, you're going to underestimate the degree of change because you actually have more information than, than, than your scoring model says you do. I had a nice heat map slide, but I didn't actually get it in here. So, um, But uh, those of you at the workshop tomorrow will, will see it, I think. Then... The last limitation that we're, we're dealing with is the fact that you have to give the entire test to get a balance, right? And this has a few of a few knock-on effects. One is that it increases testing burden. It takes up more, more clinician time, but more importantly, it, it puts more testing burden on the patient and increases the potential for their um, fatigue and frustration to influence score estimates, right? And at some level, it's just not, it doesn't feel good as a clinician to force a person with severe aphasia to answer every question on that even even you know past the point at which you know they're they're not going to get it correct right and and uh, you know a compassionate and experienced clinician can know all right we're not going to get any more from that from 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 doing this but i'm going to argue it's better to have a scoring model that licenses that that intuition and then supports it with data and inference um and then also importantly in clinical settings at least you know if you're spending you know a lot more time than you need to on your naming assessment. That's taking time away from from uh, you know other important things you could be doing, like building rapport with the with the individual and and supporting their needs and other things. So um, the characteristics of a better system for measuring anomia severity is going to have uh, at least these four characteristics. Um, it's going to have a universal metric that's going to be. Uh, not greatly influenced by the particular items that are chosen or the particular sample. I didn't really go into that much, but ideally we'd like a measurement system that doesn't depend on whether you norm it or construct it based on this sample or that sample. The units are going to have some supported claim to interval status, allowing us to make meaningful comparisons um, uh, both between people as well as uh, within people over time. Uh, and then we're going to have a uh, uh, well-supported uh, confidence intervals to support inferences about those things, and we'll be able to do it in a way that doesn't overly burden the people that we're trying to help. And so I'm going to argue that this one-parameter logistic item response theory model is a really good way to start this kind of effort. It's, it's work that Trostomos and I have been engaged in, as I said, for several years now. And um, just as a kind of conceptual introduction to this. It's a little bit, so it, it's related to regression and linear factor analysis conceptually, right? And so everybody's kind of familiar with regression, right? Observe variable regression, you, you, you regress one continuous variable on another. The notion of linear factor analysis is similar in that you're regressing a bunch of observed variables onto an unobserved latent variable that's basically composed of all the variants that those unobserved variables share. Item response theory is conceptually similar to linear factor analysis, except we're replacing the observed uh, continuous variables with observed dichotomous variables, ones and zeros. Did they get the item correct or did they get it incorrect? And the, the regression weights or the, 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 the linear weights from a, a linear factor model, we're replacing those essentially with logistic regression coefficients. That's that's what, that's that's item response theory in a nutshell for you know grad students in our field. Um, 
but so just to, to dig into the technical details of the model a little bit more, um, it uh, is based on this equation, right? Which is the logistic equation that, that takes uh, theta, the Greek letter theta as the ability level and delta as the atom difficulty level. And so basically we're predicting the probability of a correct response, the probability that, uh, you know, person I encountering item, yeah, person I encountering item J will get a correct response as a function of their ability and the difficulty of the item is this logistic function that basically resolves as the difference between the person's ability and the item's difficulty, right? Just one minus the other um, and putting it on this log Oz or logit scale keeps it linear across the um, across the continuum. It basically takes the bounded percent correct scale and uncaps the ends, stretches out the ends and makes it possible to relate uh, the, the log odds of a correct response to linear predictors in more straightforward linear relationships. And by collecting a bunch of data from the relevant population on a bunch of items, as the folks um, affiliated with the MOS Affiliated Psycholinguistics Project database did over the course of many years, you can calibrate the items, essentially fit the items to this unidimensional uh, you know, logistic factor analysis model to put, put together a bunch of words that don't really go together. Um, and you can derive these uh, item response curves that relate the probability of percent correct on the y-axis to the person's ability on the latent trait scale on the x-axis, right? And so we, and you can develop a curve for each for each item. Here I'm showing you cat, iron, and microscope. And there, that difficulty parameter is defined for each item as the point at which a person is going to have the point at which a person with that ability level is going to have fifty percent chance of getting it correct, and that's arbitrary. You can set it wherever you want. You could set it, you know, in some applications, it's set at seventy-five percent, but we typically go with fifty percent. And you can see that on this latent trait scale, which you can kind of, you know, sort of have units that are kind of similarly sized to a z-score scale in this application. You can see that you know, cat is very easy, and a person with very low ability has a high chance of getting that item, of naming that item correctly. Uh, microscope is much more difficult. The person, it takes much higher ability to, to get a, uh, to have a good chance of naming that correctly. Now, this model uh, has a number of benefits. It supports crosswalking and equating tests, and also, as I'm going to show you in a minute, can support computer adaptive testing. It does come with some assumptions that you have to, to meet, or at least approximate. Um, and probably the most important, the most interesting one for, for our discussion today is the, the unidimensionality assumption. So this is a this is kind of the simplest version of IMT. There are multidimensional versions, as we'll talk about hopefully later, but this model assumes that that uh, anomia, the naming, you know, naming ability is a unidimensional thing, right? Now, obviously it's not. We know that that naming ability depends on minimally, you know, semantic and phonological skills and, and probably some others that we could disarticulate. But to a first approximation, this is what we're doing anyway, right? When we administer the PNT and count the number of items correct, we've already decided to treat naming as a unidimensional thing. And, and actually, for many purposes, it's a useful approximation, right? It, it is, it's, it's wrong, but useful, as the man said. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, I think that's all I need to say about that. Um, there are other there are other assumptions, technical assumptions, the IRT model that I don't think I'll go into right now, um, just in the interest of time to make sure we get to everything. Um, but another concept related to IRT that's kind of useful to understand when, we, when we're talking about adaptive testing, about which more in a moment, it, is IRT models uh, come with this concept of statistical information or item information. And it's basically, it's, it quantifies the extent to which administering each additional item increases your certainty in the score estimate or reduces uncertainty in the score estimate. And it's it's simply a function of the probability in a, in a simple model like this, where every model relates to the underlying trait at the same strength. It's just a simple function of the probability of getting the item correct, which is again, based on you know, the difficulty of the item and the person's ability. And so again, it's kind of intuitive that you get the most information from giving an item to a person who has about a 50% chance of getting that item correct, because then you're learning something, right? If, you, if, you're, if your provisional estimate is that they have about a 50-50 chance of getting this correct, you're actually learning something. If your provisional estimate were that there's a 100% chance they're going to get this item wrong, you already know. You don't need to administer it. So you're getting less information in that instance. 
And so this information function quantifies that. The nice thing about information functions is that they're additive, right? So you have here, I have the, the three uh, information functions, which are just, you know, transformations of the atoms characteristic curves I showed you on the previous slide. So we have the three information functions for each, um, each of our uh, example items. And you can see that the harder items have peaking information higher on the scale, and you can add them. And that's the, the, uh, the dotted line is, is the test information protocol test composed of three of these three uh, items. And that information function relates usefully to the standard error measure. It's essentially the inverse of the error vector. So then you take the square root of that function and you have a standard error of measure, which you can use to develop a confidence interval around your scores. And so this is what Jaroskimos and I have spent a fair amount of our time over the past decade or so working on, applying this model in what we think is a responsible way to the Philadelphia naming test, starting with the data from the Moss Aphasia uh, Second Level Six Project database. Um, so we showed that uh, you know the, the data from it was I think we started with just shy of 200 folks, and showed that um, the data showed reasonable approximation to the key assumptions of the the unidimensional one parameter logistic model, and you know we developed a scale, and then in a companion paper, we leveraged the fact that the IRT model. Basically, because it puts people and items on the same scale, you can now develop a score estimate based on any subset of the items that's, that's, that's all on that same common scale. So you no longer have to give every item in the test to get a score estimate. And that's what uh, computer adaptive testing is for, that, that facility that IRT gives you. And so in a companion paper, we did some simulation studies where we did real data simulations and basically pretended that the people in the MOS data set had gotten the adaptive version instead of the full version. And when, when, the, when the adaptive algorithm said, give them this item, we just pulled it from the database and administered and, and did uh, leave one out cross-validation and compared um, cat versions of the PNT to uh, some uh, static short forms that Grant had developed about the same time that I think, uh, I think some folks are using um, and showed that on the margins, they, the adaptive version does a better job, particularly when you're testing people that are that have either very mild or very severe anomia, right? Because that's that's where it matters. That's where you get the benefit. Because that's where a static test that's targeted at the middle of the range is giving you the least information and details. And so that's where CAT really shines because it can it'll shift the item content to, to be harder or easier as the person's getting more right or wrong. And the information, the standard error curves on the right are simply showing. The difference between you know the full test, which actually has the least measurement error, um, and you can see that uh, the cat versions of the test there um, have lower measurement error over a wider range that covers more of the actual distribution of naming ability that was in that data set. And so this is just the, the algorithm of how how computerized adaptive testing works, right? So you start with a provisional score estimate, usually you just assume person's average, but they're at the middle of the scale. You select the item that gives the most information at that point. I think in, on the PNT, I think um, it, it depends on the particular calibration. I think pumpkin is often I think it comes up. Um, and you can you can put different bells and whistles on these item selection rules. But basically, you select the one that's going to give you the most information at the score um, estimate. You collect the response. And so in a in a in the, the kind of situation we're talking about, you're sitting across, you're sitting with a, a person with aphasia at the computer. They they give their response, your, your audio recording it separately and the clinician enters a one or a zero for correct or incorrect online. The scoring model comes up with a score estimate and a standard error estimate and basically asks, have we satisfied the stopping rule? And the stopping rule can be, uh, there are a number of ways you can define a stopping rule. One way is just the number of items. So we're gonna give 30 items. You can also, as we've done with our variable length sort of follow-up test, you can define it in terms of I want to get a score that's at least as reliable as I got the first time. And that, depending on where they were, that might mean you get away with fewer than 30 items, but often it means that you need to get more than 30 because you've already given a lot of the good items that, that are targeted to that person. Um, and then once the, the stopping rule is satisfied, the test exits and you get your score estimate and, a, and, a, and a, an error estimate. With and so after, so we did the simulation work and then we followed up Drosmos got an ROI three and we collected data from several dozen folks with aphasia and showed that yes, when we do this with actual human beings in the real world and give them the adaptive test at one time point and the full test at another, the scores correlate highly. 
And um, and even more interesting to me and more important, I think, is that the estimates of error that we get from the scoring model seem to be more or less correct. Um, and so that's what's shown on the, on the left panel. The fact that all of this, the dots and the scatter plot are within the, the shadow error bars. The shadow error bars are based on the uh, the model-based standard errors, right? Which are essentially precision scores that are kind of like an internal consistency. They're, they're related to an internal consistency reliability metric. They're basically based on you know, how tightly the items correlate with one another. And we see that they predict an amount of error that's approximately the same as the amount of error that we observed on, observe on test retests, which is like makes them kind of useful for drawing inferences about whether a person has changed due to treatment, right? Because this in this design, we, you know, people were getting tested two weeks apart, they're in the chronic phase, no treatment in between, right? So we expect the scores to be stable and they are stable within measured error. And, um, and, and also another thing I'll point out is this, this is not always the case. It doesn't, in, in my in work I've done on patient reported outcome measurement, similar kinds of models where the constructs are fuzzier and harder to nail down than anomia, this is, has not turned out to be the case. And the, um, the models are returning uh, uh, incorrect estimates of error based on what we get. You know, people, people are showing more variance in test retests than the models predicted. So, uh, um, so, and I'll just say, you know, what I just went through, Gerasimus presented in this forum in 2019, I think. Um, so there, that talk is available in the C-Star archives if you want more detail on those things. Um, uh, but one thing that's new since then is that we now have available a Shiny app that will administer the PNT CAD. It'll give you options. You can give the full test. You can give either of the, the static short forms that Grant uh, developed, um, or you can give uh, the, an adaptive version. You can also just set it to where I want to, you know, as long as you give at least 30 items, after 30, you can stop whenever you want, right? And it'll, it'll, it, you know, It'll stop and give you a score estimate. Um, I have other slides that, that actually demo it more fully, but in answer is time. I'm not going to go through those. There's time at the end if people want to see them, we can do that. But this is there, that URL. Also, you can download a local version. If you're R, if, if you're an R user, you can download the uh, uh, the pack, the R package uh, from Rob Kavanaugh's GitHub page. I don't think I have that here, but that's that's out there. Um, and and linked from this page. So now I'm going to transition. How are we doing on time? Yeah. Yeah, I think, okay. So I'm going to transition. I'm going to talk about an application of the PNT CAT and this work in, in the context of a current clinical trial that we're running for semantic feature analysis, right? Um, where we're using the fact that we get these latent trade estimates from the PNT now. And we have a, as I'll talk about in a moment, we have a model for relating the item difficulties to psycholinguistic to lexical properties of stimuli. So what we're able to do is select treatment items based on a single administration of PNT, right? So let me let me back up and unpack unpack that a little bit, right? So in 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 many contexts, if you're going to run an aphasia treatment study or you have to select a naming treatment study, you're going to have to select items to treat. And the way that that has I think most often been done is that you get a big set of items, at least usually around 150 200. And you give them three times in succession, usually over the course of a few days. And then you take the ones that the person got right out of those three times. Maybe you take ones they got zero or once. Maybe sometimes you go up and you, you'll take up to two out of three. But if they got them right all three times, you're going to exclude those from the ones that you might potentially treat. Two issues with this, pro, this protocol. One is that it's inefficient. It just it takes a long time and people don't like it. <laughs> um, the other is that it's actually vulnerable to regression to the mean, right? So if you're selecting items based on extreme low performance relative to other items, and then if you're just to take those items and then say, all right, we're going to start treating them, there's going to be some improvement just because you selected extreme low items as part of your process, and there's going to be some regression to the mean there. And um, this is... I oh, can't remember if I have this. No, I, well, I have an example of it here from our own work, from working on our first SFA trial. There have been a few other, there are a few other examples of this floating around the literature, but this, we did this um, at BA Pittsburgh uh, back in the 2010s, where we, we, we followed exactly that assessment protocol. So we, we administered a set of 194 items twice. Um, and then a third time, we took the ones that they got once out of those two times, just to kind of lessen the burden a little bit, um, just to see whether that was a, um, yeah, because those items were, we wanted items that, that they got one out of three times. We only treat items that they were 33% correct or less on. And so we, we 
implemented this procedure to do that. And um, then having selected the items, you know, we can look at the scores on just those items at time point one and time point two. We can't look at the total score for time point three because we didn't give all the items that time. But then having selected those items, we administer them the fourth time and you see there's a nice bump in, in performance. And there, there are at least there's at least these three other examples where this is evident in literature. Um, and so there are a number of things you can do to to avoid this. One is you you do this procedure, but then once you've selected the items, you give them two or three more times before you start treatment to see where the baseline actually is, right? Um, but one thing we're trying, which as I'll when we get to the end of this section of the talk, we'll see it's kind of sort of working. Um, uh, is that we are using the fact that lexical frequency, age of acquisition, and word length are pretty good at predicting difficulty on this latent trait scale that we developed for the CDC, right? So um, uh, in the initial 2015 paper, as well as this follow-up paper that we did, uh, we regressed th those item difficulty estimates from the PNT on these three predictors, and you can get about 70% of the variance, right? And so we can use this now you know, ideally, we'd have the whole set of 200 potential treatment items uh, calibrated for, based on empirical data the same way we did the PNT, but we didn't have that. But what we did have is this, this model that does a reasonable job of predicting item difficulty. And so we collected a bunch of color photographs from the internet um, and did some uh, some norming, got collected name agreement norms on, on those pictures, um, focused mostly but not entirely on things with one word names, maximally two word names, and um, ended up with 222 picture stimuli that met our criterion for name agreement and normals. And then we estimated the, the difficulty on the same latent trait scale that we have for the PNT for these items using these three variables. And there, there's the equation for predicting item difficulty on a T-score scale, that is where folks from the, the, the calibration sample, folks from the mean of the calibration sample have a score of 50 and the standard deviation is 10. And we use this to select the items for treatment. So we, we get the latent trait score from the PNT and then look at the difficulties and use the IRT model to try and, try and select items where the predicted proportion correct was between 25 and 33%. Now that turns out to be really hard because we don't have enough hard items for the folks with mild aphasia that show up and still want naming treatment. So we ended up with a much wider range. In fact, it, it ended up being, I think, around 5% on the low end. We had a couple of pretty severe folks up to, and I think we went up to about 65 or 70 percent, and we really cut it off there because the assumption is if you're coming in above 70 percent, there's enough measurement error there that you might actually just ace the test at time one before you even start treatment, and that's, that's something we wanted to avoid. Um, so the, the basic uh, design of what I'm going to present here, this is in the context of a clinical trial with a between groups design and randomization, but what I'm talking about here basically is that at initial screening, we're giving people the 30 item computer adaptive PNT. Then we're selecting the treatment item, the treatment and generalization items, a set of 60, 30 to be treated, 30 semantically related to look at generalization. And then when they show up in Pittsburgh to do the trial, um, about five or six days apart, we, we give them that set of 60 items twice, right? And that's the data we're gonna be looking at here. Um, oh yeah, and that's stuff I just said, right? So 60 items with about six days in between uh, assessment one and assessment two. And um, I'm just gonna you know, show you the data. I'll talk, talk through the analysis. So here's actually, this is the distribution of item difficulty scores that we got for our set of 222 items. And I just, it's just, it to me, it was interesting to look at it in relation to the difficulty of the items in the PNT, right? So on this, you know, sort of kind of Z-score scale, where people, the mean of the people is just above, uh, just above zero, um, uh, and their standard deviation is actually a little bit larger than one. Um, we we see that uh, you know the PNT is targeted much lower, right? The the you know negative 0.45 on the scale versus 0.1, um, whereas the items that we are potentially treating are are substantially harder, and in fact slightly. Uh, harder on average at 0.26 than the people are able, right? With with some spread around that, so it's a useful item bank to choose from. Um, and here here are the results we got, right? So uh, on average across all the, I think there's 29 people represented in this data um, the, um, in our trial, 
on average, the predicted number correct out of 60 was 27, with a standard deviation of 12.7. Um, at baseline one, people are scoring at 24.1 items correct on average, and at baseline two, at, at 28.1. And um, we ran t-tests on the logit transformed uh, uh, different scores, essentially, paired sample t-tests on the logit transformed scores, and it turns out that the difference between, you know, essentially people are coming in significantly lower than predicted at time one, and they're coming in more or less right on the money at time two, and because the time one and time two scores are so highly correlated, even that four item difference is quite robust statistically. So we're seeing improvement across our baseline level. Um, it can't be because of regression to the mean because we didn't select the items on the basis of extreme low scores. We're selecting on the basis of a prediction um, and they hadn't seen these items before. Um, but we do have, so there's a practice. Right, which David Howard has talked about at some length, right? People, you, know, you, you give people the idea, you don't give them any feedback, don't do anything, just ask them to name them repeatedly over the course of a few days and they're gonna, there's gonna be some improvement. And I think that's what we're seeing here. Fortunately, the design of our larger clinical trial doesn't hinge on a stable baseline here because we do have, we're, we're looking at questions related to two different variants of the treatment of random assignment to groups. So um, if nothing else, this has been, you know, a way for us to use these tools to target the items to an appropriate level, right? Oh, and that's the other thing I was gonna show you is the scatter plot. Uh, right, so here are the scatter plots. And this is this is where, this shows that we're actually, I think, doing something useful here, right? So um, uh, the left panels, right? The x-axis is predicted accuracy out of 60, and the y-axis is the baseline one on top and baseline two on the bottom. And so we're getting, the correlations are high, 0.85. So our predictions are correlating with observed behavior in a usefully high range. Um, and you can see that the, the predictions are, you know, about <laughs> equally scattered above and below the, the identity line. The blue line is, is identity. If, if everything lined up perfectly, it would be all along the blue line. And so that's not best fit to the data. That's, that's just the prediction of perfect agreement. Um, but you can see that, you know, when we compare baseline to base, baseline one to baseline two, it's clear that, that there is, you know, there is notable, small but notable improvement uh, across that baseline level. But the prediction is working well and for some reason working better at time two than it did at time one. So that's that application. Oh, we don't time. Yeah. All right. I'm gonna have to speed up a little bit to get through this next one. So um we so another thread of the work that, that we've picked up on in the past couple of years in our current grant cycle is applying this work not only to naming of nouns, but also to naming of things, which is 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 important and, and 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 insufficiently studied, right? And so, um, uh, this from I, I don't have the year on here. Is this last year, Gerasimos? That you guys, yeah, twenty twenty two, Gerasimos and and uh, um, uh, Marion Casilia, who is has just finished her PhD recently with Stephen Wilson at Vanderbilt, uh, spearheaded this paper, and took data from aphasia bank from one hundred seven folks from aphasia bank and their verb naming test data from the NAVs and calibrated it to a, a, an IRT model. And similar to the PNT showed that it, um, it approximates the assumptions to a useful degree and, um, and actually does a reasonable job of measuring the severity of verb naming impairment in that sample, right? And basically what this slide is showing is that for the vast majority of the people in the sample, you're getting a conditional reliability of buzz point eight. Um, so it's it's a, it's a reasonable first attempt at measuring severity of verb naming impairment. The really cool stuff is work that Mary Ann has done since with cognitive modeling using uh, um, extensions of the 1PL model, explanatory versions of it that I'll show you in a minute to look at the, the construct validity of the verb naming test, right? So we know a lot about what goes into naming nouns, right? We, we you know, there, here's LaBelt's model here on the left, and Barry Bell has a, a kind of similar but different and important respects model that that um, informs us about the important underlying factors. For verb naming, it's it's been much, much less well studied, right? What, what are the relevant um, features that, that drive someone's ability or failure to name verbs? Um, and so we took the VNT as a, as a test with some data, um, that we could use, um, and, well, I should say we, Mary, primarily Marianne. This is this is work that she, in fact, she she put together these slots and for which Drosmos and I are both very grateful. Um, but what this is showing us is uh, 
an extension of the unidimensional uh, one parameter logistic IRT model into an explanatory and response theory framework where you can include covariance at the person level of the model as well as at the item level. And so you can look at what are the factors that influence performance, both on the person side and on the item side. And, and it basically, it's it's using the same tools that we can use to fit um, generalized linear mixed effects regression models. It's, it's you know, multi-level models have a, uh, multi-level regression models have a, a nice uh, isomorphism, it's not there. They have an isomorphism with latent variable models that, that's useful and can be exploited in this regard. And so, um, the, um, I guess, in, you know, in getting to the, getting to the point here, um, the first issue, we first looked at the item side of the model and looked at what, you know, what are the item covariates that predict item difficulty? Importantly, the things that predicted difficulty for the nouns did not have any predictive power for verbs. So age of acquisition, lexical frequency, and word length were not predicted. Now, it's also important to bear in mind, we're looking at 22 verb verbs, right? It's a lot different from 175 nouns. So there may be a power issue, um, but to a first approximation, you know, there's no large effect of these variables that are accounting for 70% of the variance in naming and noun naming difficulty. Based on the development of, of the VNT, we also looked at argument structure, because that's a good candidate. That also had no effect, but it turns out argument structure is pretty highly correlated with imageability, which did show up in these models. And so um, that's that that turns out to be an important predictor, imageability. So and, and it, it turns out, you know, give right the three argument verb give is just a lot less imageable than shave, right? Um, uh, and and that correlation between imageability and argument structure is going to make this hard to tease out. It's going to require a lot more data, which we're in the process of collecting. Um, on the person side, we had two predict two potentially relevant predictors available to us in this data set. Uh, one was a phasia subtype, um, which I don't love as a as a predictor in this context, but it was interesting to look at given that there is you know Broca's aphasia, agrammatism, there's some overlap there, potentially at least in those categories. Um, and then we also had aphasia severity in the raw scores. Um, and um, you know, aphasia subtype. Not surprisingly, it didn't really pop out, at least with a significant mean effect. There were some interactions with aphasia subtype that I'm not going to talk about. But aphasia, but you know, as you would expect and hope, aphasia severity predicts uh, people's ability to name verbs. And it also uh, moderated the effect of imageability, such that people with milder aphasia showed stronger effects of imageability in terms of its influence on, on naming difficulty. And so, you know, the point here is that these, these models offer a useful and elegant set of tools for investigating the construct validity of our instruments and like, you know, helping us to produce evidence to substantiate the claims about them that we want to make, right? That verb naming has something to do with morphosyntax versus image of it. Um, and, and, and I think we, you know, there's, a, there's a, an open program of research here where, where I think we can go about uh, identifying predictors on both the person side and the item side that, that drive performance, and that's a, a useful endeavor. Um, so the, la the the final bit of the talk here, I'm going to talk about Grant's model for a few minutes. Um, so and a grant presented on this, I think it was maybe also 2019 or it was in, in the late 20 teens, right? And so, and I want to, what I want to do is, you know, is uh, point out that his model, so first, it, 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 it comes from the same framework, or it's related to the same framework, and it's, it's using a lot of the same statistical machinery in a much, uh, in a much more impressive way, frankly. Right? When, when, when Grant published this paper in 2018, it was, it was something that we've been thinking about for several years. How do we get to multidimensional measurement? right, because we, you know, it's unidimensional measurement of anomaly severity is useful, but it's not, it's not the full story. We want to unpack the full story. And, and Grant developed, Grant and, and, and Greg and Joyce developed this new perspective on this by marrying multinomial processing tree models to the IRT models, basically. Um, and I, I'm not going to be able to talk cogently about multinomial processing trees, except it, now we are, you know, instead of modeling the zeros and ones, now we're modeling each kind of error that a person can make, right? So the, the Philadelphia naming test has this very well developed system for coding errors in either semantically related, chronologically related, mixed errors, non-word errors, various types, and so on. And so what this model can do is predict those different error, error types. Um, but whereas traditional uh, multinomial processing tree models from 
psychology assume that people, the people in the items are all completely exchangeable, you know, essentially single level models. Grant's innovation was to marry the uh, IRT model to the um, to each step in the multinomial processing tree, and basically putting that one PL IRT model at each step, each stage of the process, and 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 making it into a more fully psychometric model that can deal with uh, variance between people and between items, and that's you know we think moving forward is potentially really useful. Um, and you know, more technical stuff about the model. Basically, you know, you at each stage of the, you, you, there's a thing you have to do, right, in order to avoid these error types, right? So, you know, first you have to decide to make an attempt, right? You have to actually produce a word as opposed to a description or nothing at all. And and, and there's a certain chance of, you know, certain ability level and item difficulty associated with that. So you have to pass that stage. Then uh, as the model goes, you have to uh, get to the right semantic neighborhood. And as it turns out, it's a detail of the model that that, probability depends only on the person. It doesn't depend on the item. Um, and so once they pass that step, then they go, you know, if, if they pass that step, right, they go to this lex, lex sem, the lex semantic step. And that's a process that depends on both the difficulty of the item from doing that step as well as the ability of the person to that step. And so you, you go down the chain and, and, and because these probabilities are modeled, uh, plausibly modeled as independent, you can simply multiply the probability as you go down the chain and get a, a probability of correct response at the end or the probability of making any kind of error along the way. Um, and, um, and, 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 and Grant in that initial paper and, and subsequent work has, has, has um, produced some evidence to suggest that the, the, both the person score estimates that you get from this model along with various dimensions as well as the different kinds of item difficulty um, relate meaningfully to you know, other other variables, things like uh, lexical semantics, things that measure lexical semantics or phonological processing ability on the person side, or things like word length and lexical frequency on the item side. And he's also shown, oh, this is just showing the um, the, the, the the one PL IRT version that, that fits into Grant's model. Um, but Grant also has shown that, uh, that, that his model, which is a cognitive psychometric model, right, that, that it comes with estimates of measurement error and which is potentially extensible to other items does um, a, a potentially better job than the, the Dell SP model in which it was you know, which certainly inspired it um, at, at predicting the different response types. Um, and while it's still uh, quite a, it's a lift, right, to use this model. Grant has done, I think, a good job of putting web-based tools um, on the internet that, that certainly put, you know, that folks like me and Ross must have taken an interest in and can use, but you know it's a, it's still a heavy lift, uh, you know, even for a clinical research group, let alone a clinician. I think right now to to implement this model in a useful way. Um, but I think down the line, as things like automatic transcription and automatic error coding, which which Drosmos is working on from online, it's going to get more and more possible. Um, another thing that I'll just say in passing is that you know Drosmos and I have been thinking about this model for several years now. Um, and and we think there may be some ways to tweak it to you know it, it may there may be some ways that it can be simplified without reducing its ability to do a good job of predicting the data, um, and so that's something that we're exploring currently, and that's that's essentially what that is about. I'm not, not going to go into those details right now, but um, that's that's something that you know I look forward to talking to you know folks about uh, as we move move forward in that. Um, and so that's what I have for you today. Um, these are the folks that are on the particular team. It's not everyone in our labs, but th these are the folks that are dedicated to this line of work in this project um, uh, and, uh, and the folks who've worked on it in the past. And uh, it, it really, you know, um, takes, it's, it takes a lot of people to get this stuff done. And we are grateful to the efforts of all these folks, um, Marion in particular, for helping us put, put that portion of the talk together. Thanks for your time. Happy to take questions. It is our custom. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. So um, uh, it's our custom to start with questions from the room. And I would ask you um, to uh, repeat the question uh, because of the mic we're using. For the I'm sure you don't have to remind you. Yeah. Um, you spoke a little bit about a computer adaptive uh, model and the training. And I was curious, um, 
kind of what that looked like in the sense of, did it look the same for, for everybody? Or like, so if you show me the word cat, uh, and I got it correct, maybe you move on to something more challenging, like the computer one. Yep. Or if I got it wrong, would it, would it, is it possible for them to then present something that's phonologically similar versus semantically similar? Like, is that what the computer adaptive model looks like? Because that seems very clinically relevant, right? To be able to use what someone knows and what someone doesn't know to give them that next uh, trial. That's an excellent question. Um, and so the short answer is our, the current adaptive test, no, it's, it's not that smart, right? It, it, it collapses semantics and phonology onto a single dimension. It doesn't differentiate between them, which, you know, Again, as I made the case, you know, I think it's useful for some purposes, but does not do that. And, and that's what a model more like grants is going to be necessary for. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, sort of, and, and I think grants model can, you know, is informative about which items are um, difficult phonologically versus semantically, right? And, you know, we know, like, we, we, know what the, we know what some of those predictors are on the, you know, on the item side, but I think it's also possible to model them. Um, and, and in fact, I think maybe, you know, me just my, Two cents. I think Grant's model, as excellent as I think it is, it's more complicated than it needs to be for that purpose. I think you could probably get away with something closer to two dimensions, semantics and phonology, for that purpose. Um, but even, I mean, the complete, you, know, um, you know, I'm not that smart, and, and unidimensional IRT for computer adaptive testing is hard enough for me. Like, you know, even adding another dimension, like with, with adaptive testing, it's, it's a, it's a it's a challenge, and, and, but it's something that, that we are working on. And, um, and I think, you know, I'm, my, my head right now, because of some data we have available, is pointing in the direction of using multidimensional IRT to get at uh, a language value, like a comprehensive aphasia test that includes more than just naming. But I think the question you asked points in an equally, maybe for some purposes, more useful direction of, uh, you know, uh, a usable multidimensional model that would just differentiate semantic challenge Logical challenge that could, could make the conclusion. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, thanks for a really great talk. I really appreciate it. Uh, my question is uh, clinically oriented. I wonder how uh, how should clinicians working with people with aphasia, treating people with aphasia, how should they interpret generally their change in, in naming performance from a more detailed perspective. <coughs> like what I'm asking is, how can they adapt a more fine-grained analysis of the naming responses into their sort of tentative ideas? Where is that <coughs> our age currently, or, or should they be, what should they do? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, and I think, you, Use the use the PNT CAD app for one. Like if you if you just want to measure uh, overall naming ability, I think I have vested interest, right? But I think it's 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 pretty good, and it gives you more than our uh, model based and, and um, have better statistical properties that come with estimates of error measurement error that I think are at least somewhat trustworthy. Um, I think you know to, to you know I think that counting error types, you know, sort of like extracting more information, kind of essentially what Grant's model is, extracts more information from the data by counting different error types. That's really useful. Um, I think that as a field, we uh, don't appreciate how much error there is in those measurements. And I think that's, that's one of the real promises of Grant's model is that it, it takes it away from you just counting the number of semantic paraphasia. It's really hard to know, like, okay, eight versus three, or, 20 versus 12, whatever, right? You know, when you can develop uh, a late trade score estimate from those counts that comes with a model based estimate of the error associated with that late trade, that's when you really, that's when you're getting to measure. So I, I don't have a satisfying answer for what clinicians should do in that regard. I think I think we're still at this, we're still kind of in qubits, right? Right, right. You know, um, and and I think that's 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 what clinicians can do right now. I think the, the most, I think these are these late trait models are the most sophisticated thing that we have for measuring overall severity when it comes to measuring finer grain. I mean, I, you know, Grant's model does, diverse approximation does a good job of extracting these estimates. I just, I, I don't think we're at a point yet. There's reason to ask clinicians to use it. Thank you. I have a question. 
Um, so for that um, PNT uh, cat app, how do uh, I'm involved in the healthy aging? Um, and right now we're using a naming task, um, but a lot of times naming tasks don't have a, a ton of variability for healthy adults. But with older age, you do start to see, for example, like slower response time and some errors. Um, how does that do with like an, an aging population? Um, do you get any variability? So we haven't, you know, one of the things we haven't done, and this is a little bit of regret on our grant side, which we're not collecting normative data from healthy controls. Um, and I would not expect a healthy control sample to show much variability at all in the PNT. Um, my, you know, if I have to test somebody that is potentially normal, I, I go through the TOF because it's it's got harder. In fact, in fact, I have some data I'm going to be presenting at CAC later this year on it where we administer we've given a TOF to a reasonably sized sample of folks with data from our current trial, and it's it's much you know, it's more difficult than the PNT. Um, uh, it turns out that the the, late, the difficulty estimates don't line up perfectly with the ones you get for normals, uh, for healthy controls, but um, you would need a harder test. So to answer your question, you need a harder test than PNT, and that's that's also part of what our current research project is about. We're, we're giving, we're you know, we're uh, we're deep into the grant cycle. Hopefully, when we come out the other end, we will have data from uh, something approximating 300 folks with aphasia on. 600 items, six or 700 items, more, yeah. Uh, you know, a mix of nouns and verbs. Yes, some of which were chosen specifically to be more difficult, including the top, right, where, where we, we incorporated all the, all the, most of, well, probably not all, but most of the big name naming values and are called all some additional items. And one of the goals is to develop a latent trade scale that we can use for folks with aphasia that covers a much wider range of ability. And the hope would be then that we could, you know, collect uh, you know, healthy control data on, on you know, an appropriate set of those items that, that, that could potentially be used in this kind of study. It seems to me, so with your answer, that addresses if you if you take uh, accuracy as an outcome measure, right? But right. what about reaction times? Is there a yes. Right, that's, that I is think that's actually what we're using in the aging brain record is reaction time is probably more informative than Drosmos, do you want to take that? Do yeah. up and Drosmos is going to do a reaction time on it. Here comes trouble. <laughs> Make it work. Well, thank you. Well, I did get a trip out of this one. Well. <laughs> uh, so reaction times, yes, they can be an indicator uh, of uh, naming difficulties. And right now, we've just got funding for a new project where the idea is to actually blend those two things. Because we already know, like clinicians know, it's not the same thing if you show me a picture and I respond in two seconds versus showing you the picture and me taking nine seconds staring at it and responding. So right now we don't have like response, like a way to take into account response times, but with computerized, computerized adaptive testing or computerized testing in general, we do have now this, you know, we're actually already kind of collecting this kind of data, we're just not using it. So the idea is now we just started like this past month, we started a project where we're gonna look at how much more informative are measurements where we blend response times and accuracy scores. And that will also open up the way to start thinking about, well, now does it matter what type of error people are producing? Is it a phonological, a semantic, a mixed? And do response times vary as a function of the type of error? So it is now we're going to start linking those, those two together. So stay tuned for uh, what's going to come out of that. And I'll just to tack on a little bit, I'll put in a plug uh, for Will Evans at the University of Pittsburgh. He's doing work on reaction time modeling in the context of aphasia treatment, right? So he's using models of reaction time that have some kind of glancing similarity to the IRT models that the Charles talked about, but which are different, um, uh, to look at like the deadline, at which point do you like, give the person the answer versus let them continue to kind of struggle to get it. And I, but I do think that there could potentially be applications of those kinds of models to the, yeah, to what you're talking about. So, you know, how to, how to develop uh, useful score estimates for folks that, that are more, you know, you know for, for the normal age cohort that's going to be accurate almost all the time. It's a different rate. So, you need controls. Sounds <laughs> I had a question that I put online, so I'll treat it as a question online from uh, an Alvin. Uh, it's, it's a fairly simple a technical question that I want to start with. So on the verbs versus the nouns, Will, you, you pointed out that the, the different 
different variables predict naming success on verbs versus objects, right? Compared, so compared so to VT versus right. VT. Sure, it's still However, it wasn't, it wasn't entirely clear to me if with that conclusion you're taking into account that the VNT deliberately doesn't score phonemic errors as errors and mild semantic errors as errors, right? So how does that affect that conclusion? So we did like different types of error coding. Like we actually took and we, we error coded the responses in different ways to see if that makes a difference. I don't think it makes a huge difference. I think what it is a, what kind of complicates the interpretation a little bit more is that the people who put together the BNT, they actually controlled for some variables and that might be distorting a little bit the picture. So our first like pass with this was like you know, we tested the machine and we tested the logic of actually doing this kind of analysis for construct like validation and the results I think are very informative but we're really looking forward to now having this item band that has 300 verbs, right? With uncontrolled sort of uh, uh, psycholinguistic variables and now fully explore what is the relationship between the psycholinguistic variables because that, that is very informative, at least for test, for test and skill development, being able to demonstrate that items difficulty varies as a function of the variables you expect them to vary if you're measuring what you think you're measuring. Right, that's like that's important information that we need to have before we tell people, hey, take this tool and use it and interpret the scores in a particular way. Yeah, and I think and that brings me to the other question that I have, which I think you have you have um, touched upon. Well, I know you have touched upon. I'm just wondering if I have it clear in my mind. So, in most of the applications that you've talked about, for example, Grant's work, right? The semantic versus phonological. Um, label that the items get is, uh, is, a, is a result of the type of errors that people make on those items, right? But what happens on the VMT, of course, is that it's, uh, you have verbs that, have, that are more complex or less complex according to a theory of verb argument structure. So, and you can do the same thing on the PMT, of course. You can say, a priori, this item, labyrinth or uh, something with a lot of consonant clusters is phonologically, articulatorily more complex than uh, another item. So now I'm going to look, not, not in hindsight, not data driven, but actually item driven, I'm going to look at whether this item for particular patients is going to be harder. Is that already in there? Is that getting into some kind of like a late in class kind of model? I'm not sure. I think they so let's say you want to identify if someone has an articulatory problem versus a problem with lexical frequency, right? So you expect them to bomb on words that may have the same lexical frequency, but one is just at the same length, but one just has a lot of clusters and the other doesn't. I will respond by not responding in a way. And I will say that the models that we have now by far use data that have been collected for other purposes. And the scoring systems that we're using are scoring systems that for the PNP were developed in the 1980s. So I think like depending on the purpose of the measurement, we gotta be thinking about what is it, what are kinds of interpretations we wanna be able to make. Then align that with the items that we select and then think about how we're gonna be scoring those. And once we do all that conceptual work first, then we have to start thinking about, okay, now what measurement model, what mathematical model can map the observations to the things that we care about and start thinking about them. I think we're, as a field, we have a challenge now though, because of how many, how much data these approaches need, we're kind of restricted in using like scoring schemes or systems that were not developed for particular purposes. So to answer your question, I think we would need to start thinking about that as we're developing the scoring system. If I want to tease apart lexical semantics from motoric, then I need to think about, okay, these are two constructs that are separate. How do I need to set up my scoring system to be able, once I administer the test, to make inferences about the two things that I care? Right now, the PNP says, ignore any phonemic errors that are like phonemic distortions that don't cross phonemic boundaries. In a way that it says, ignore that construct completely, right? Take it out of the equation, maybe not worry about it. So it would be kind of hard to use a system that was developed, designed precisely to tease that out, like, take it out of the equation, and now start thinking about how do I use it for that purpose. So 
So I think, like, depending on the purpose of you know, the, the, expert, you know, the assessment, we need to be thinking about all those things like, early, as early as possible. But in theory, yes, you could do what you asked if we had set it up. That was a very funny answer. Any other questions from our room? No. I don't see any other questions online, so you, you've satisfied everybody who was online. They're all cheering. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. That was great. Thanks. Thank you.